Uh, it's really exciting to be here today. Uh, you know, I've, I've done similar talks across the U.S. at, at different colleges. Um, I've talked in India, but this is my first talk in Armenia. And uh, we've, got, we've got quite a turnout here, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, especially this is pretty last minute notice that this was announced. So thanks everybody for coming. I'm here really to talk about Enterprise QA today. And you know, it, it may be different than maybe other conversations about QA you've had. Um, I want to lead in a little bit with a conversation about our company. I think it's a really good example. We talk about Enterprise QA, what we mean. Um, you know, there's so many apps in the world today. There's so much software that gets used in the marketplace. And really, when you talk about Enterprise QA, you know, we're not, we're not really talking about, you know, that app that we developed for teenagers to go chat with each other over lunchtime, right? Um, AtTask is a company that really drives the workflow of enterprise organizations. Uh, our client base has a, a pretty substantial number of Fortune 500 companies. And what we do is we drive their workflow. So we drive their method of business to say that you know, the things that they do uh, to, to drive their business, um, we consolidate, uh, we make more efficient. So if we're unable to put quality on our application, if we're unable to drive that, right? We have a number of Fortune 500 companies that, that can't do their business. So when you talk about enterprise QA, um, you're looking at you know, working with these companies, these wildly successful companies, and having them use your software to get their jobs done. So when you look at that, and you look at the importance of QA, I think it's pretty, pretty evident what they expect from you. You're looking for world-class quality. So as we go forward, you know, let's talk about what QA is. And I'm going to go over some of the, the things I've heard over the course of my career, some of them from my own team. Uh, which I'm not exactly, uh, exactly proud of. But uh, over time, I tend to ask this question of my teams as time goes on to see where we've gotten as a team and what we think about QA. So maybe some of you who are in the industry can, uh, can comment on this and look at this. So how about finding all the bugs? Is that what QA is about? What do you think? Wouldn't it be nice if we could find all the bugs? Wouldn't that be great, especially before we roll to market? I don't think we do a lot of that. How about something we do right before we release? How about that? <laughs> um, I, think, I think you talk about the different methodologies that roll, if you go back 10 years ago, that actually to say something that we really wanted to do right before we released. Didn't quite get to. How about the sole responsibility of the testing team? Is that what quality is? We go, we roll code, we develop, and we just roll it over to QA, and they'll take care of all the bugs? That's not really, a, not really what we do either. A necessary evil of software development. Uh, this is mainly from business. This is a, almost an executive standpoint. We kind of have to test, so therefore we do it. How about with that thing you do when you can't quite hack it in development? All right? Do we just, the, the really smart people go into development, and then you know, people don't quite make it in development go to QA? I certainly hope not, because you're all here to talk to me today, and uh, it's going to be a pretty boring conversation if that's the case. So how about a dead-end career for technologists? Do we need smart technologists in QA? Is that something that's important? So obviously, you know, I've kind of set it up, but all this stuff is wrong, right? And what I'm going to do over the course of this conversation is really go through this presentation and show why this is wrong and how the industry has changed to really require all of these things in QA. So let's talk about going fast. Um, I hear a lot of my bosses, that's the primary focus of what they want to do. So what's it take to go fast, right? We want to deliver fast, we want to have great code, but we want to push it out to market as quick as possible. How about this, right? If we push something too fast and we don't do the right job on it, it creates problems, right? It doesn't matter what kind of product you deliver, you go too fast on this road, you might end up here. So pretend you're the manager of this project, right? You're rolling it out to a Fortune 500 company. Is this acceptable risk? Is this what you want to do? Right? You still want to go fast though, right? So what do you think is better? Do you like that or how about that? Does that look a little better? Nice. So anybody recognize this road? Do you know what this is? So this is the Audubon. Right? There are no speed limits on the Audubon. So why is that? Right? Look at look at how it's designed. Look at how we fit the architecture. Look at those guardrails, right? Guardrails let us go fast. So when you think about QA, if you take nothing else from this presentation today, I want you to think about one thing. And it's not, probably not something that you've heard before to deal with QA. QA, real enterprise QA, is about innovation. It's about letting your product team and your development team really move fast. And that's a hard thing to do. But if you set up an architecture that lets you go fast, if you set an architecture that lets you go fast safely, right, reduce that risk, 
then you're able to reduce fast to go fast and, uh, and deliver to the kind of companies that we want to. So this is a pretty common slide in the US. Anybody seen this before? My team doesn't count. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of QA, of, of how we went through and you know, where we came from about 10 years ago to where we are now. So this is you know very overused slide in the U.S. especially, right? I think, I think most people who have had some experience working in the U.S. have probably seen this, or if, if they do any research on QA or on Agile online, they've seen it. This is a big example of what it means to be an enterprise software and what we, problems we were dealing with about 10 years ago that we've solved some of by now. But basically, and I know it's really hard to read, and I apologize for that, but basically what it's talking about is the different teams and how they perceived it. That first slide right there, on the left, and as you can see, there's the whole thing sort of surrounds around a swing, right? If you can view that as the product. If you look at the far left slide, that's really how the customer just describes their problem and what they want solved. So if you can look at that far left slide that's there, does that look like a really good solution for a customer problem? Right? I don't I don't think the customer really knows what they want, right? So it's going through the problems like that. So it goes over next, right? How the project lead understood it. So you see See any problem with this swing over here? This right here? Is that maybe going to be a little uncomfortable for the person using it? So as you go forward, you can kind of see the transition. So this is how product designed it, right? They said, well, the customer wants that. That's what the lead told us. They want to swing into the tree. Well, we don't want to swing into the tree, so let's just make a big hole. Right? I don't think that's really how trees are designed, right? So I don't think that's going to work. So as you go through, right, you see that's how the coder, the coder actually coded it, right? It doesn't work. That's how, that's how the business analyst described it when we went to sell it, right? It doesn't exist. This is, this is how we tried to sell it, right? This is how we build it. As we go through, the, the core concept of it is on each part of it, we were really consolidated, right? We were individually siloed. So the conversations that people had around these things, as we went along, everyone had a different idea. And at the end, the customer didn't know what they wanted, right? This is what they really wanted. So evolution of QA has been a lot of dealing with that, right? These are the kind of problems you deal with, right? So when you go back to, you know, is QA and the responsibility of finding all the bugs? Some of it's really about being liaison between the teams to make sure that these kinds of misunderstandings don't happen. We're sort of the glue that comes between product and development to make sure everybody's on the same page. So talking about, go back 10 years ago, I think most companies were operating in waterfall. Um, biggest problem is, you know, as you work, individual silos, right? We do all these things separately. We don't collaborate. Um, projects took a very, very long amount of time, right? Projects that were scheduled for three months could take up to two years. And then when you got to the end, projects were over, over, over time, right? The schedule was, was run over, um, added budget, and what really suffered here was test. So uh, you're not going to be able to see this apparently at all. <laughs> so the idea here is, you know, the idea of, the, in theory, waterfall was to do all those siloed things, right? In practice, you'll see a big X over this right here, and that's really what happened to test very often. You get to the end of the project, and we were out of budget and out of time, and what suffered was QA. So it's a really, really bad model, because not only would we go forward and we'd run out of time to test, but also that project scope would change over that long period of time. Customer expectations of what you were going to deliver, that changed either from what they wanted or what we could actually do. Um, there was a lack of collaboration between all the teams, so what got designed, by the time it got to development, even if it wasn't feasible, we didn't have enough time or, or money to actually change it. So we sort of drove forward and hoped for the best. Um, and also time for customer feedback. That's probably the biggest one, right? Is that, you know, look back at that tire swing that we worked with, that that's what they really wanted. Um, if, you know, you roll something out to customers that can give you feedback on that before you develop the entire model and roll your whole team to it, uh, you know, you really get that feedback quicker and you, you fail faster. So that led us to Agile. And I don't want to get into a large dissertation on Agile, but just to say that you know we were failing faster, we were moving forward, the cycle time was better, the involvement of QA for the collaboration, all that brings in. So this is really what we got out of working with Agile. We had this rapid delivery of code so that we found this, this way to move much faster with smaller pieces. Um, we had this engineering collaboration across product and QA and development that we had that conversation. So when we found out that dev had a different idea than product and QA of what we were supposed to do, and working with those three groups, um, we really discovered that before we got to code. Um, fail faster and learn. We learned more from the market. We learned more. We were able to roll things out to customers and have them say, you know what, that's what I told you I wanted. But now that I see it, that's not really what I wanted at all. 
and be able to go back and, and meet their needs in that way. Um, and then, you know, plan, react, and compete. Um, you know, if you have four companies and they all have the same idea, you know, the team that can do it the best and fastest is going to win. So Agile would let us do that, figure out what the, the minimal product we could roll out to compete in the market and get that client base. So when you talk about the evolution when it's gone from Waterfall to Agile, you know, challenges for QA is that when you say something's Agile or Waterfall, that really doesn't define the QA methodology. Just because you're Agile doesn't mean that that tells you what you need to do around your quality assurance. Go back to that original example, you know, if I'm developing software that helps high schoolers chat over lunchtime, I can handle a couple bugs. It's going to be okay. They're going to be a little resilient to that. If I'm working with a Fortune 500 company and they can't get their work done because my product doesn't work, that's a completely different model. The level of comprehensive testing you need to get that out is totally different. So one of the challenges we faced in QA is as these methodologies have come out, they're really software development methodologies. They weren't geared for QA. So in the quality industry, there's been a lot of conversation and talk about what does that mean? You're agile, but what else ties in? And the, the simplest answer about that is it really depends on your client base and your objectives. And under that model, there's also this QA methodology. So talking about generically, whether Waterfall or Agile, right, if your organization does either, the question is where do you test? So I'm going to talk about it generically for a bit. I'm going to talk about this from, you know, not the perspective specifically Waterfall or Agile, just QA best practice. So if you looked at this, right, these are generic phases in, in any methodology. So where should we test? What's the, be what's the best place? So it's a little bit of a trick question. The main answer is everywhere, right? That's where we want to test. We want to be all across the board. But the real key is as early as possible. Um, in a waterfall model, you know, the, one of the reasons that failed for QA was because they just waited. I know I was on teams you know, 10 to 15 years ago where there was this idle stage for QA where you just sat around waiting for code. You know, that's, that's not the, the, the life we live in now. That's not the, the enterprise QA model that, that organizations work with. So, you know, what strong enterprise QA organizations do is they st start right from, they work right from the start of the product. So you're involved very heavily in requirements. You're testing those requirements, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of metrics after this to show why, but you're testing that very early in the process because really that's where defects start to happen. That's where misunderstandings happen, right? That's where, you know, we look at what one person in product understands, we look at what dev understands, and you have a mistake. And if you don't look at that and identify that early, that ends to be a misunderstanding that amounts to a lot of rework. So we want to test requirements, we want to test code, we want to test the product as it's released, and we want, to, we want to test delivery. But we want to be a part of the whole process. So opposed to that waterfall model, there isn't one area. We're collaborating with all teams at all times to make sure that this goes out with quality. So I run a requirements-based test organization. Right? When we test, we test early. We work very closely with product groups and principal engineers to make sure that the stories and the requirements that we roll out, that they, they contain the logic and that everyone gets on that same page. One of the advantages for QA in this way is that you know, QA doesn't really build anything, right? We're not innovating. You, know, you have the project, product team that has to build things for requirements, right? Has to find out what the client wants. You, know, you have engineers in you know, development that need to develop code. They need to manage this to make sure that the product actually meets the needs. Uh, you know, it can actually be feasible, right? And meets the needs of product and the client. But QA, we're sort of assimilating this information, right? We, we get both sides of it. We're technical on one side where we're driving those requirements, but also we're working with product to make sure they're what we need. So a lot of times what you get in a requirements-based test uh, model is you end up in stages where you know, we've defined something or haven't defined something, and we go to write a technical test case on it, and it becomes a pretty big gap. And we have a conversation about that gap, and what that would have amounted to is in the situation where we weren't looking at those requirements, development would have gone and done it on their own because they can create. So, you know, I always make the joke that if you give development, you know, a requirement on the, on the napkin, that they're going to give you something, right? It doesn't matter what you give them for requirements. They'll come back with something. Um, the question is, is it what product really imagines? Is it, is it what we really wanted? 
So in a requirements-based test model, we really, on the QA side, we drive that logic. We make sure everybody's on the same page. If there's a gap in requirements, we fill that gap and we do it before we start code. So the advantage of that is we identify those, those gaps, um, like, you know, they're called ambiguities, you could also call them defects and requirements. We identify them early. Uh, we make sure we're all aligned across all teams. You know, it gives us some planning and estimation transparency, right? If we bring up problem areas early, you know, we're not finding that out mid-code. We're finding it out early in the process. This also drives the efficiency in our automation. So as we work forward to automate code, that logic's very clear. Then the people who are doing automation can really focus on the technical aspects of the code. They don't have to worry about the logic of the app that's already ready for them. And then it really drives clear business decisions. You know, if you come up with a major ambiguity and gap early on, if it, it affects the feasibility of what you're doing, you can give that up. You can move on and do something else, right? If you find that out when you're already coding and you're already midway through, that's, that's a problem. You've already wasted some cycle time. Here's some basic metrics. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen this. This is a pretty old slide. Uh, it drove a lot of what went into Agile and certainly driven a lot of requirements-based testing. But it's really about where defects originate and the cost of fixing them. So really interesting, I think if I had asked that question before the slide came up, I think the common answer is defects happen in code, right? And the truth is, you know, we, we get defects in requirements. It's not so much that the code doesn't work. I think you know, if you go to most organizations, your development teams are pretty technical. They know what they're doing. But they're developing to the wrong things, right? They're, they're filling in gaps that exist in requirements. So, you know, over 50% of the defects that we have are found in code. So it seems like that's a pretty valuable place to test. And then the advantage of finding those defects, right? I don't know how well they can see this, but this is basically all the generic phases as you walk through them. Uh, you know, if we find a defect in requirements, you know, it involves us to, to maybe add something to a story, maybe have, you know, one more meeting, a conversation. Um, if we find that in system and in integration test, or if we find that in production, right, that's a lot more work. That's heavier on schedules. That's rework for the teams. It may not be even feasible. Um, and then if it goes to a, a you know, client, it may be just perception of your application that you don't have quality, or it may totally break what they bought your product for. You may lose that sale. So that's basically around the evolution of QA, kind of where it's come, you know, some basic movement of how that's affected it. Um, another very large conversation around QA is this manual versus automation. I can't tell you the number of conversations I've been in regarding QA where people have said, you know, manual's a thing of the past, there's no more manual QA, we just need automation. So I'll talk about that a little bit. So this is industry perception around manual testing, and I think this is kind of how a lot of organizations use manual testing. Um, I don't know how well this is coming through over here. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, it basically is a big circle that says bang head here. And I think most organizations when they think about manual testing is they really think well we're going to get a lot of people and we're going to throw them at our application and they're going to shake it really hard and all the defects are going to come out. Um, and it's funny to listen to but that's honestly how many organizations do their QA or think about it. So you know people have been in this industry when they think about agile and they're like well we have to automate we don't need any manual testers. They're really thinking about manual testing the wrong way. So, I mean, these organizations, you know, it's brute force testing, right? Let's throw people at it and, and you know, have them get, get the defects out. Um, it's time, they think about it being time intensive, right? Hey, well, if we can automate this, it'll be much faster. So therefore we should have manual testers. They think about the human error around it, right? Well, these are people testing. If we have machines testing, then they'll catch the bugs every time. And then they think of it being as a costly investment, right? We're spending, we're spending money on, on getting individuals when we can actually build this into some kind of technology. And you know, some things around this, they're correct. Right? In some ways, if you're treating testing in this way, right? if you're treating it like brute force testing, that's not really the value of manual QA. So I'll get to that in a minute about you know, how the proper way to use manual is. So automation pitfalls, right? as you drive forward, these are the pitfalls that these same people, when they drive to automation, run into. Right? So it's a learning process for a lot of organizations. Um, basically, you know, how working on people who are in automation, right? Giving them, it's basically giving them two jobs to get them on both sides of the fence. So, you know, working someone who has spent their entire life coding and then saying, well, you're in QA, so therefore you should be able to take, look at requirements and build comprehensive you know, test logic. 
that's a completely different discipline. But in removing the manual component, you end up getting that. Um, you know, so you end up with this, this poor business analysis, these test logic gaps that show up in the application because they're not filled. Um, feasibility study, if we automate everything, well, not everything should be automated. It's not efficient to automate everything. There are areas where we don't want to automate things that aren't, you know, in these last two things, really. Working with things that aren't repeatable, uh, working with things that, you know, aren't maintainable. So there are areas where, where we, we end up, you know, churning more time doing automation that's not, that's not workable. So problems with regression management, right, managing your logic. A lot of times they're so caught up in the code that when they drive it forward, they don't manage the logic. So you end up with poor logic over time. It just tends to fall apart. You have a lack of traceability. And really, we lose that skill concentration. I mean, if you're in automation, I mean, well, you're a programmer. It's a code discipline. Right? If you're not coding all the time, I think if you ask any developer, I mean, that's how they increase their skills. They code all the time. They're in the code. They become experts. If you keep pulling someone out of the code to have them do something else that, number one, you know, most of them in that discipline, that's not the career they want to pursue. It becomes a problem. So let's go to strong manual testing and look at a strong staffing model. You know, this is generally how I've run teams and how I felt it's the best way to apply these two disciplines. So strong manual testers are logic owners. You know, you're looking for someone who does that business synthesis, that can work with a product team, that can work through requirements, that understands the logic side, can understand what the client wants, and then take that from the technical side and drive that together to understand what are testable requirements. Right? Product generally runs things from the client point of view. You know, they don't dip into the application. Development goes and they give you a feasibility study. You know, can we code it? But that business synthesis, right, that takes, a, that takes a sharp mind to be able to take that and figure out what's the right level of tests, right? What do we want to test? What actually targets what the client wants, right? What, are the, what things on the technical side are we going to want to make sure works so that links together this product for the client? Um, doing ambiguity reviews, you know, finding that gap analysis, finding those defects and requirements before they roll the code. Uh, doing the, that test development, right? Setting an efficient logic to say these are the tests we're going to write. And then doing exploratory testing. You know, machines are just not going to find everything in your application, right? We cannot possibly write enough test cases to catch everything across our app. So there's just things that you're going to find by looking at the app and putting people on it. So strong automation testing ties into that. So as you work through the automation testing, right, we're really looking for developers and tests. You know, I'm not looking for someone who works on the logic side of QA. Those skills happen over time, but they're mainly built around the technical side of what you're trying to do. So working through this, right, we want people who know how to code. We want people that can efficiently write these tests and, and do them at the right levels. Um, we, want, we want to work with clear defined logic. If I can hand requirements, testable requirements from a manual team, and hand them off to a, a true, you know, true programmer who has that discipline, we can rapidly get those, those tests into place. And that helps us you know, build our feedback loop for QA. And we really want to do things that are repeatable and maintainable. Right? We don't want to focus on things that are one-off you know, migration tests. We don't want to work on things that we can't maintain that are going to be headaches down the line. We want to be selective. Uh, we don't want to create more debt for ourselves in automation. So all this ties into a real continuous integration model. I don't know how many people are familiar here. If you were to the last at task discussion, uh, a colleague of mine, Jesse Daddle, came and did an entire presentation on this. So I'm not going to go into to deep detail on this. But what I want to say is, you know, as we move forward and as we work and we work in an agile model, right? As we do the right things in automation and we drive our, our feedback loop to give the information to developers that they need as fast as possible. What this has really led to is an entire architecture around QA to take those automation tests and every single time a developer checks in code to give them feedback immediately on what they want to do. So I want to, I want to tie this a little bit to what I said in the beginning about QA being about innovation. Right? If you don't have a model like this in QA, if you're not working off this, you can't really innovate or you can't do it well. You know, what we do is we build this architecture and it allows both product and dev to, to actually move forward and innovate against what they want to. You know, if they can take risks inside the application, if they can move forward and say, well, let's try this in code, right? We have massive regression structures and integration with other products. We cannot possibly know when we write code how it's going to affect everything in the product immediately. Right? There's no way we can do that from a planning level. But if we have this structure, 
and we control our regression testing, and we're able to do that every single time we take a chance, that feedback is immediate. So if we take a risk and we, we do something with the code that does break half our application, we find it out immediately when they push code. We don't find it out later at the end of the project when it's too late to change it. Um, so also when I talk about you know the kind of people we need, you know, there's an original slides about you know, dead end careers for technologists and people that can hack into development. You know, I mean the structure up here it's a it's a pretty simple slide, but it involves you know database integration, it involves server maintenance, it involves integration of many many different kinds of tools, right? The tests that are run require a really tight tight development to make sure we're doing it fast and we're getting that feedback. So there's a lot of opportunity there for a lot, lot of intelligent people to, to uh, kind of add to the process. So I'm going to go through, I talked basically about evolution, right? I talked about technolo technological aspects of what we're trying to do. I want to show you the current model that we use at task as an example of this, of how we drive code. So you'll see this is an individual sprint team. So as we're working forward, Really, if you want to take a phased approach, right, we're working on requirements in the far left. You see that collaboration between QA, PM, and development. And what we're feeding back before any of the teams pull a story is we're making sure that both Dev and QA are involved in the product vision, and we're both getting feedback from our particular discipline. So Dev is feeding back on the technical capability of the model, right? Is it feasible? Is it going to be performant? Can we actually do it? Well, QA is working to, to build those technical test cases, right? To build that, that map between requirements and test cases and filling in those ambiguities to make sure we didn't leave any gaps that are going to bite us down the line. So we're doing this test around requirements. And until we, we all reach synthesis there and that work product's done, that stays in a planning phase, right? So if we do hit pitfalls, we don't have to run that story, right? We can do something else. But when we're all sort of collaborated on that, and that's going to roll off to, to the actual sprint team, it can get pulled into the sprint team model and because of our discipline, because splitting that manual team off from automation, we're able to actually automate that within Sprint. So part of the story that we run, part of the requirements, is not just developing code, but it's also developing those test cases that are going to make sure that code works. So as we work in the middle here, right, we're developing both, both the tests that are going to validate it and the code that's going to drive it. And at the end of that process, as we work forward, we're going to pull in the manual team for anything we couldn't automate or shouldn't automate and do that testing, but also work exploratory to take a look at what we've done. So you can see the collaboration across, across the whole model, right? And part of that exploratory involves the PM team as well, right? We pull them in to make sure that before we finish off and sign off a story that we actually know what we were supposed to do for the client. And then as we roll out, that team will merge that story and are on a separate branch at this point, and they'll merge that into the master branch where it pulls in all the rest of the product. And that's really where our continuous integration fires off. And every test that we've written that's automated will go against that. And that'll, that'll escalate that risk and tell us, all right, what did we break in the app? You know, did we do good things on integration here? Do we have a lot more work to do and give feedback? If it turns out to be risky, the team can revert that code and fix it immediately. But no matter what we do, right, no decision is made. We've never rolled code that has to go to production. Right? We're not blocking anybody else's work. So this is sort of a, a you know, single scale. And I can actually on the screen expand the number of teams we have. We actually have eight teams that roll code at the same time. But each of these are individual sprint teams. And this maybe puts it more in perspective, right? All these stories are being rolled, all these ideas, all these things that we want to do for our clients. So, and all that risk is being fed back to the teams to let them know where they are. And as those stories become ready, and that automation suite actually looks good, then we're ready to release code. So we talk about the talent needed in QA, the changes over the few years, you know, there's a lot of need for people in this industry. And it's kind of exciting to talk, you know, at college here. You know, I remember, I go back you know, 25 years ago, right, when I sat in these discussions, you know, primary in my mind was always, you know, what can I do with my career? What can I do with my skills? And the interesting thing is on both sides of it, right, on the manual side for logic or automation, if, you're, if you've got a code discipline, if you're good with databases, if you're good with servers, if you just like to play with tools, there's so much that we can do across it. Um, you know, we, we build from manual test developers, right? We build that logic, so we need that business synthesis and that logical mind. You know, we need pure coders for, you know, our organization is Java end to end. You know, when we hire, you know, people in automation, right? When we hire our uh, developers in tests, they take the exact same exam to get in the technical assessment to get into the organization as our developers do. Right? The discipline that we need on both sides is just equally important. 
And then for our CI architects, it's such a challenging field to find people with the multiple different you know, skills and different tools in different areas that they do get to play with lots of cool stuff. Um, so at the end here, you know, technological leadership comes from all of that. Right? We have people from all over the industry that come in because they can lead over these different subject matter areas. Um, so there's a lot of need and a lot of push from that. So the question that usually comes out from that, if I have one-on-one -on -one conversations about this with people, is really, you know, but what does the industry reward you for, for these skills? So I don't know if you can see on the left, but I pulled basically an assessment of enterprise QA, right, salary basis for Armenia. So if you look across the board, the gray where it starts is kind of your minimum, but the red is your potential. So I think if I pulled up, um, you know, a developer list of different disciplines of straight core development, you'd see it pretty much matches up the same amount, right? So as we look at disciplines and product and development, the expansion area, especially in leadership, right, as you grow, there's so much need for this in the industry. And, and you know, the focus has been off the last few years, but with Agile, you know, with that, with that evolution and revolution has come on, we've gotten a lot more, uh, more intelligent people to be pulled into QA. Okay. Well, that's the presentation for today. Um, I want to leave it open for questions. I think we have some more time left. So if anybody has any questions for me, I'm available for probably the next 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out today. Um, I want to give some information. Uh, if you want to reach out to me or if you're interested in that task and the careers we have available, um, we also have a blog that's uh, pretty interesting. All our technological leaders are blogging on there, putting out, you know, fit with the challenges we face in the industry from product all the way to development. So um, if you're interested in this or you're interested in a career with that task, you know, take down the information and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Is there a chance to see this presentation PowerPoint on your blog or somewhere? Yeah, I'm asking to have it uh, put up to the blog. Uh, probably next week it'll be up there. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So, how we use manual testing, right, is to really just sit at that early layer and build out the, the core logic for it. So they sort of feed together. I want to say it's more important, right, but they go hand in hand, right? So, you know, the people who work in development, I mean, they're, they're or in, in our developers and tests, right, I mean, they're pure coders. You know, we want them to be efficiently driving that. You can't, you can't automate logic in a sprint cycle and expect them to do that exploratory level around it, right? They have to be in, team, in time with the sprint team. So how the manual team works is they really develop that logic and we, they feed them so it's basically a checklist. And then they can work on the technical side to figure out, you know, where do they want to drive those tests down to, right? Do we just, we work in Sekuli, we work in Selenium, but, you know, the developers and tests that work for me, we drive deep down layers. We write unit tests, you know, we, we write tile tests, controller tests, right? We work in Spring Framework. So, Getting them to that, be that technical, you can't pull them from that discipline and have them drive the logic as well. That's two jobs. So in working in coordination, right, they're both equally important. Right? If you have poor test logic, it doesn't matter what you automate, right? I mean, if you're testing the wrong things or you're not testing enough or you're not testing in the right way, if you're testing efficiently, you're going to have problems. I mean, machines only do what you tell them to, right? So, so that's, that's really how they work. Did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, uh, could you give me more specifics on how, um, what is the work of QA on the requirement gathering stage? Mm -hmm. So what will happen from the product team is they'll deliver us a story, kind of an agile story. And you know, how we work with it is at the same time we'll sit with a principal engineer. I'm sure. That's it. <laughs> I like your ringtone. <laughs> um, they'll work in coordination with that group. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll deliver what I call a requirements to test map. So they'll take those requirements in that format and they'll drive it into all the individual pieces of logic that make sure that we would be able to validate that. So all our test cases are done at the requirements level. So when we get done with those requirements, the tests are embedded into it and product development and QA has all seen it. So that's before anything gets pulled by a sprint team. So when the sprint team gets it, they have basically all the information for, you know, for QA, for development, to drive that story. And, and the great advantage of that is if you have those testable requirements, right? It's like, 
It's like going for an exam and someone's saying ahead of time, hey, by the way, before you go to that exam, right, here's all the questions to the test. Here's everything that we're going to test you on. And it gives development the perspective around, okay, this is everything I need to do. I have a clear idea of that. Now if I code, it's more test driven. Answer your question? Uh, is it somehow uh, like you're writing your test for API or? No, know, at that really? level it's black box. So we're doing it from a customer perspective, right? We're kind of joining what product does and what their vision is with what development will do. So we're taking the technical side and merging it in with the, the black box, you know, with the, what the customer expects. Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions? Uh, so probably in uh, American industry we have like two departments, it's computer science and engineering. Mm -hmm. And just a question, if I'm a student and I'm studying in one of these departments, what are some skills that I should have to decide that, okay, I can go in the QA field, I can become a QA, or what are the, some tools and some information that I should start learning, because we don't have such a profession here in, in Armenia to, for becoming a QA. Right, you know, that's a problem in the industry, right? I mean, it's the same in the U.S. I mean, individual disciplines for QA, we tend to get them from other disciplines. I think the easiest answer for that is around automation, right? I mean, if you're, if you're going to become a developer and test, I mean, you need, you need to be excellent with your code, right? That's really where you want to focus, right? We, we hire core developers for that, for, for automation positions. For manual, it's a mix of things, right? I mean, you know, business logic, understanding that, understanding, you know, how to, how to look from a customer point of view, right? Communication skills are hugely important. Any skills around formal logic to really identify, you know, when you look at something, what are all the ways that we work around it, right? A piece of logic, how are all the ways that you would approach it? So it's, a, it's multiple skills, but I think, I think for manual QA, it's very hard to find people who are the right way in that discipline because there's not one, you know, one career to work on. Mm -hmm. I think if you, if you have a logical mind, if you can approach things in, in a way that really breaks down the logic of a situation, um, if you have great communication skills, I mean, a written and verbal, um, and you're able to bring that techn technological side to like from an information technology point of view, where you understand how technology works and you can you know, build that together, I think those are the things we look for. So it's, but it's a challenging field to find the right people in because that's a lot of skills to kind of bring forward. Anything else? Okay, well I'll encourage anybody who's a little shy to reach out for me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to be there. Um, we'll be blogging on the Atas blog. You'll see my name and my colleagues up there. Feel free to come out to, to those discussions and talk about it. I'll try to get the presentation up there on the blog next week. So if you want to comment on that as well, it'd be really great. But okay, thanks everybody.